Hello, friends, and welcome to a, a special edition of the Robcast. What am I saying? Yeah, okay, this is a special edition of the Robcast. This is a special inauguration edition of the Robcast, and uh, I've been looking forward to doing this one for a while because I have Zach Exley with me. Welcome to the back house. Thank you for having me. <laughs> this is amazing. I can't believe it. And my friends, the reason why we're releasing this podcast today is because Zach, well, when you see hear his story, and his, you're going to be like, oh, my word. But then when you hear what he's up to now, I especially want you to hear this in light of the inauguration. And especially for those of you who are like, what's happening? Are we going to lose our country? Is this the apocalypse? Who, what is, what is going on here? You know what I mean? Yeah. He, um, I want this to be an answer to that, a way that perhaps when it's darkest is all often, or people are the most scared, or it's the most oppressive, or they're most like, what have we done? What's happening here? Is often when the greatest acts of imagination, because otherwise everybody just skates through. Are you with me on that? You, yeah. you know what I'm talking yeah. about here. Yeah, yeah. So, Zach is going to tell you about something he's up to and how you can be a part of it. And when he first told me about it, I was like, my Robcast friends would... They would love to hear from you. They would love to hear where you've been, but they would love this idea. <laughs> like, I'm already picturing people, like, in their minivan in Alabama going, yes! Yes. <laughs> we need you. We need that woman in the minivan in Alabama right now. <laughs> ah. So, keep listening. Okay, so, before we get into what Zach Exley is up to, I don't know why I say that like you're not in the room. <laughs> before we get into what you are up to going forward, let's go way back to how you got in. Was the Howard Dean campaign 2000 your first political well, experience? Well, that was my experience? first, yeah, that was my first camp electoral campaign experience. It was 2003. And, uh, but I actually, you know, I got started as a labor organizer. You know, I went, even though I grew up this middle class kid in Connecticut, I became a left winger in college, and I wanted to save the world. What and made I, that? What made that happen? I don't know. I really don't know. I just really, yeah. I mean, and you know, I, I, I could, you know, when when Obama, when the Obama campaign was happening, which I was sort of involved in here and there, there was this thing that the organizers did where they had to learn their story of self, us, and now, and they had whole trainings and workshops where organizers and volunteers would would come up with this story of self. And I just could not participate because there was, you know, there's there was no moment that okay. you know there's no experience. You you we could we could talk about this more, but the thing is, I think so. Something happened in college. Yeah, I mean, I just I you know for some reason I just had this orientation that there shouldn't be billions of people starving. Yeah, and there shouldn't be billions of people getting caught in the crossfire of war and billions of people living lives under in soul-crushing jobs, yeah. and that there was just this obviously way better world that was waiting to be created. And um, and I and that's the thing, I, I don't know why, when people try to, you know, say like, oh, why would you believe in that? It's, I think actually people have always, I think that's the default setting of our brains, actually. Absolutely. And, you know, like that, you know, people for thousands of years look into any religion, and thousands of years ago, people were writing these religious texts that were, that most people in the world are following now, that that contain within them these dreams that someday everybody will live to be a hundred. Nobody's babies will die, um, and and what you know that maybe it's partly because I grew up in a community where that was true. It seemed like it should be easy, you know. And I I traveled a lot when I was young. Like when I had this travel bug. Like I grew up in the most placid, boring Connecticut suburb. <laughs> so even though we all lived long and ate well, and none of our babies died. It was so boring, and so I wanted to go see other places. And I so so this could have something to do with how the direction I went in. Um, I I wound up spending time in like Western Kenya, living in this little village for six months, where people didn't have power or electricity, and where half their babies died. Um, but and uh, and then I, I I lived for a year in China, where you know it was just like 1987, you know, communist China, and uh, that. I, I did not become a communist, but it did have a um, impact on me to see that this whole country had sorted itself out so that people were living long, eating well, and their babies were not dying. And that was true. 
It was true, actually. Yeah. Really? And, yeah. And, and for there was a brief moment in college when I would, because I was trying to sort all this, figure all this out in college and reading left wingers, right wingers. There was a brief moment when I was like, oh, it must be because communism. But then I kept reading and realized, oh, actually, a whole bunch of countries that were anti communist and really capitalist and socialist and basically every manner of political system you can imagine, they all, there was a, there's a whole bunch of countries that figured out how to have people live long, have enough to eat and have no babies dying. Very few So there was something dying. that transcended whatever the particular political arrangement was. Yeah, it turns out that the, tw- the story of the 20th century was the story of big chunks of humanity figuring out how to have that basically nice life. And, and the crazy thing about America is that, like, we were one of the countries that helped figure that out. We were one of the first countries to get that. But, but unlike a lot of other countries, we just figured it out for a portion of our population. And, oh, you know, we definitely covered West Hartford, Connecticut. But, you know... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well said. But there's this road, Prospect Avenue, where I grew up, and, on, and it's a straight line, and it divides Hartford from West Hartford. And it was, like a wall in apartheid South Africa back then in the 80s. No, no, this is Eight no Eight Mile no in the Detroit. Case. Yes. The 10 freeway yes. at some level, yes. like in different places, almost everybody in a lot of cities is like, oh yeah, this side and that side. Yeah. And it was black and Puerto Rican on one side and it was white on the other side. And there was no, there were no problems of Trayvon Martins walking across the street and getting shot because there were like police on them. You know, any kid who tried to cross, there were police on them instantaneously, you know? <laughs> and wow. so there were, you know, so it was really a, apartheid in a, in a lot of ways. And in Connecticut, five, we had five cities in Connecticut and they were all on the list of the poorest 10 cities in America. And Connecticut was the richest state in America. So maybe some of this stuff had to do with why I became a lefty and wanted to go. <laughs> so, so, but you had some sense like this is not right. Yeah. And you set out to, to try and understand how did it get like this? How do you make it better? Yeah. What is behind all this? So then you... So I set out in, you know, classic messianic white guy style <laughs> to go fix it all myself. Messianic white guy yeah. style. <laughs> so I was going to go save everybody and, you know, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, but I, I read a lot of labor history in college and, and I was really inspired by the labor movement, which was the last movement when like a majority of the people in America were mobilizing to make America better and, you know, and challenging power and challenging the establishment and 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 actually like you know most of america won a middle class wage you know uh through the labor movement by these huge mass movements so i was like okay we need to learn about that and the labor movement was actually unions you know old dead unions they were recruiting college kids when i got out of college so uh so i went to work for the like like some kids from college would go and work on uh, you know in man in a uh, you know, management consultant training program. I went to the union organizing training program of the AFL-CIO. And they put us up in hotels and gave us rental cars. And we went and knocked on workers' doors and tried to organize. And so I went through like 10 years in the 90s of learning how to organize and not organize. And, but, but, then, but then I got, I, got I, I, I was a techie. And so when the internet came along, it was actually in 2000 when... Remember when this crazy thing happened in 2000 when the Republican got the majority of, or, or sorry, the Democrat got the majority of the, the votes? popular vote. Yeah, the popular vote, and the Democrat uh, lost. Sorry, I'm botching this. The, the yes. same thing happened back then that happened yes. just now. Yeah. Yeah, and... Um, you can get the popular vote yeah. and lose the Electoral College and lose the election. Yes. And More so people it, can vote for you and you can lose the election. Yeah, and we were all shocked by this in 2000. So, but I heard somebody predicting this was going to happen, and so I st- I put up a website before the 2000 election, and it said, "Here's a list of locations, and you know, send me an email, and we'll add to the list of locations." But here's where we're going to have a big protest, calling for the popular vote to be respected, if the popular vote is different from the electoral college vote, and so uh, so this website was up, and and this really- was one websites. This was early, yeah. like this, this was, was 19, the very, very 2000. front yeah. edge of the internet. Yeah. So people weren't doing this sort of thing. No, this is a whole new thing. Yeah. And uh, I love, by the way, I love it. I love talking about when the internet started. Because I remember my sister-in-law bought, she's like, oh, I bought movie tickets 
online. And, <laughs> I, and we were like, yeah. why? That is the dumbest idea. Why won't you just go to the movie and buy the tickets? I, all the ways right. that 15 years ago, we were like, you're going to buy shoes online? That is the, yeah. That's never going to work. Yeah. Parentheses, Zappos. Right. Or, you know what right. I mean? I know. Yeah. <laughs> so people weren't organizing through the internet because people weren't doing anything on the internet. Yeah, it much. never happened. Yeah. So, so then, but then the day after the election... Um, there was, I, I had like eight, literally 80,000 emails downloading into my inbox. 80,000? Yes. Yes. I never 80, read most of them. Yeah. And so, and I, I actually, Whoa. I didn't even, I forgot, I literally forgot that I had put this website up and I was just sort of in a bit of a daze, you know, that, um, this had happened, you know, and that, and that George Bush, you know, this, the like not so bright son of this other president. It was the whole thing was so weird, you know. It wasn't quite as weird as what we're going through today on inauguration day. <laughs> but uh <laughs> but it was really weird. And so so I yeah, anyways, I well by the time I finally checked my email and rem remember this was also back in the days before Gmail. So the the email would actually download. It would say downloading one of 200 emails. And so this is like downloading <laughs> one of 80,000 emails. And um, so the whole, like the whole world, you know, was like, whoa, wait, let, wasn't there this website? And, um, and, and it was getting news coverage. And so then there were protests. And so this was the first distributed, um, you know, flash mob political protest that ever happened, actually. You organized it. I did, yes. And uh, so you yeah. were part of this. There's two thousand people turned out here in L.A. So the oh and man, and then it but it fizzled out. So you know, of so course you it didn't were make like, difference. so the, I mean, this isn't in history. Essentially, there's this new technology, the internet, which is changing everything, and you were one of the first to go, oh, this internet could be used to organize people politically. Yeah, which there, then led to yeah. president the next presidential campaign. Yeah, because so I I was doing all this stuff on the internet like you did back then, you know, and. Uh, and, and, and like you said about, you know, ordering shoes and the first time somebody did that, you know, the news media obligatory does the story of first shoes hold on the internet. So I just, I, there was a whole bunch of us and we, we have this, you know, sort of, you know, club, we, we sort of stay in touch of all the wacky people who were doing stuff on the internet back then. You know, and uh, it was a bit like ham radio, exactly, or the first people right. to use drones to take right. pictures. It was a little bit like, yeah, my cousin back in the shed is making something out of wires. Yeah, no, we're still in touch. <laughs> like, uh, you know, like th there was, and, and I, and, and the way I monetized it was, I started s just making bumper stickers, like, you know, uh, snarky bumper stickers, like regime change starts at home when Bush started talking about regime change, <laughs> which is how I wound up working on the Dean campaign, actually. And but the are you responsible for the bumper sticker? That said, George Bush is pure evil. No, no, I I would never be so crass. I had like George Bush, um, you know, um, born with a silver spoon up his nose. You know, so uh, just weird. <laughs> I was highbrow. Actually. Yeah, just so, high highbrow. Yeah. Well, you know, because there was this thing about Coke. Yeah, about I I was a different oh, person back then. Yeah, okay. yeah. This was before I became a good person, and so I was just being snarky. And uh, but but we. Um, but yeah, so there was all these people doing this stuff. So so then I wound up going to work for MoveOn.org actually, mm -hmm. and they because they they noticed some of the stuff I was doing and MoveOn, its brand now is very different than what it was back then. It was actually this very middle of the road um, sort of like voice of reason organization that uh, had come out of the impeachment, you know, the Bill Clinton impeachment, and so there they were like hey, can we not spend three years talking about this stuff? Can we just... And so their solution was censure the president and move on. So it was like very reasonable, like, you know, good old-fashioned American. It was Wes Boyd from Michigan. You know, he was actually this guy from Michigan, software entrepreneur, was the founder. And um, and so then I went went to work for them and then, then did a bunch of stuff with them. And, then, and And they were one of these first, you know, group on the internet, organizing people politically and then that led to me going to work for Howard Dean um, who was the first candidate the first presidential candidate to really leverage the internet uh, you know to, to, to build a base and, and I it, remember everybody yeah. was like what is he doing he's rocketing to the front using yeah. that was like a huge story a yeah. candidate using the internet was a huge story. It, yeah, and it was so amazing and cool, and it was such an amazing thing to watch and be a part of. And what's I, a presidential 
What is it like to be inside a presidential campaign? What would, if for those of yeah. us who've never been inside of one, which I think is all, most of all of us, what would we first notice if we got inside and saw one from the inside? Well, there's this feeling that I think you would get on any presidential campaign that, you know, had any kind of a serious shot. And, it, and it's literally a tingle that goes down your spine. And it's like you have this sense of making history. History. Yeah. And because the, the stuff that this tiny number of people is doing in this small headquarters, you know, um, could determine the course of history. And you just get this little shiver. And I think that's why people get addicted to that kind of politics, you know? Oh, because if we're making like a better blender or razor blade, we're not like, we're going to change shaving. <laughs> right, to, or or right. like, we're going <laughs> to... Right. <laughs> that doesn't have the same uh, spark that, oh, we could be like in history books. Like every kid who takes history... Yeah. ...will read about this. Or yeah, that. and I think there's actually two different sets of motivations. And one is... There are the people that get into it because they're like, I want to be in a history book. And there's other people that get in that are like, well, I just want to be around these people with power, you know? And, um, but then I think that the good people that get in are motivated by this sense that actually, you know, the stakes are very high. And if we, if what we, if the choices we make and the things that we show are possible on this campaign improve our democracy and improve our system, then that'll be great, you know? So there's and, like this noble good that's like an engine like we could make life better for people yeah i think good that's choices there here. yeah and i think that was definitely there with dean and with a lot of the people that went to work on dean and it was definitely there with barack obama and it was okay definitely so, so there dean with, was uh, oh yeah, was 2000 03. or 2004 it was 03, 03 and 04. 04 so he was the primary so it was mostly in 03 and, and then, then his then campaign ended with a scream and if you remember where were you <laughs> the night of the scream um, so I was actually back at Move On. So I went, so I, I, I sort of was on loan to the Dean campaign from yeah. Move On. And so I went back and forth a bit and we transferred a lot of our technologies and practices. So I spent a lot of time up there, but by the time he was, by the time they were in the long slog, I was actually back at Move On. And I was, um, and, and the thing is, it's been many years, so it's okay to, it's okay to, to, uh, it's like some sort of statute of limitations. You yeah, can, you I can think tell so, these but, stories now. But you know, the thing about these campaigns is they're usually complete messes, you know, and and that's it, it's there, it's like any startup. Like, did you ever see that movie that back in two thousand startup? It was a documentary <laughs> about about a startup. It was like it was a total Chaos. mess. Yeah, yeah. And so that's how campaigns are. And then you know, and then of course politicians, almost all of them are totally crazy. You know, they're they're they've got huge egos <laughs> and they micromanage and they and they're chaotic and um and 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 then same goes for most campaign managers and same goes for most people that go to work on a presidential campaign for that matter. So it's it's a huge mess. And that's so 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 I was actually, you know, kind of happy to not have to go through the whole mess. But then they recruited me to work on the Kerry campaign, and so I actually ran the this internet was, uh, program. was 04. Yeah, so he, Kerry got the nomination. So, okay, so the Dean thing was amazing, and, and this repeated itself with Obama and with Bernie. The Dean thing was amazing because it, it turned everything upside down, right? So if you, it's hard, you know, if you remember how Dean was completely irrelevant you know, they were making jokes about him on, like, to the extent that he was noticed by anybody, it was because he, they were making jokes about him on late night TV. Because he was this weird governor from, Ver, from Vermont that nobody even had ever heard of. And he wasn't even, like, the governor then. He had been governor a long time ago. And he just up and decided he wanted to run, and he was a little weird. And suddenly he was at the head. Well, well they, first they were making fun of him because he wasn't at the head. Right. And, and, but, but for some reason, he really thought he had a chance. And so everybody was joking, him, you just drop out, drop out. And, but, but, and, and it wasn't so much that the Dean campaign found the internet. The, the internet and all these people who were really sick and tired of the direction the Democratic Party was going in found Dean and adopted him as their, as their mascot, you know, as, oh. and, and, and they started donating money and they started signing up and they started making their own websites and their own blogs and, um, and, 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 and this momentum got going. And Joe Trippi, the campaign manager, was... His name was Joe Trippi? Yes. That's perfect. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, you know, he's a famous political consultant you now. Can't make that and up. he had been working in presidential politics for a long time. And he, his genius in that campaign was to recognize what was going on and defeat it. 
And so he fed those supporters. He he developed a relationship with those supporters personally, like over the internet and Mm -hmm. using all these ancient tools that nobody would even remember what they were called now. You know, like none of the, like this was before Facebook, you know, it was before AOL, friend, it was before Yahoo. MySpace. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> MySpace, friend yeah. me on MySpace. It was, it was this was Friendster, and they and they actually the Dean campaign tried to create their own Friendster, and they called it Deanster. And then they were like, "No, we oh, can't call hurts. it Deanster. We need to call it Dean Link." So it was called Dean Link. And um, but so 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 Trippy fed that right, and then there was this moment when when because of that you know stealth energy, Dean had raised. Uh, a couple of million dollars, which was way more than anybody thought he should have been able to raise. And then, um, and then Trippy figured out from the, you know, grapevine that Carrie and Edwards, the two big establishment candidates, were only going to be reporting five million that quarter. And so they were going to say, we raised five million down from seven million each the quarter before. And these are small numbers now, but they were the biggest numbers ever in the history of presidential primaries back then. And and so Dean, what, what Trippy realized was, hey, we have two million. Do you think we could get to five million? And so he asked me and some of these other young internet people back then, and he's like, do you think, if, what if we asked all these supporters? What if we said, and, 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 the, and the amazing thing that he did was the, the, you know, you never give out your number before it's time to report the number. So every quarter you have to report these numbers to the press, and that's um, a big ego thing. It's yeah, a big it's success to show thing, how, and because yeah. the press is going to read these like tea leaves. <laughs> yep. Are they going to win or not based on the money? So yeah. he says, and so you go out and raise. So he, and you never release your number. You you, you try to set expectations. but you say, oh, we're 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 not going to have any money at all. So then when you say we raise two, they go, wow, they raised two. That's more than two, more yeah. than we thought they were going to raise. So, 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 so we told Trippy, look, just, just say, just say it, say they're going to raise five. We have two. If you people give us three, the media has to declare us as serious candidates. And that's, it's the way it played out was a little more complicated. This is basically what he did. And, and there was a, and there was this bat thermometer. It was like a baseball, a graphic of a baseball player with a bat because Nick O'Malley, the webmaster and one of the architects of this whole thing, um, was a baseball fan. And so this bat thermometer was filling up to 5 million, you know, but then the money kept coming in and kept coming in. No way. And, yes. And so, and so we, I think we raised something like seven and three quarters million <laughs> and just blew away Carrie and Edwards, you know, and, and how old are you at this point? I was like, how old was I? I was like 33. I was one of the oldest people. I was the old guy in the room. So you guys are like young punks in, yeah. the, in the larger yeah. political yeah. game. And you're using the internet, which is a new weird tool tech, and you're raising millions and millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, and, and burying, <laughs> burying the establishment candidates. It was so beautiful. It was the most beautiful thing in the world that these two guys that were just like, you know, establishment juices were oozing out of Absolutely. their- Absolutely, $400 haircuts. Pour. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. And- and they and 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 we buried them in money, you know. And they, there was nothing they could do about it. That's a great phrase. Yeah, and we buried well, them in money. And that was the amazing thing was that was that we took this thing, which was the symbol of corruption and power, you know, against the people, you know, of the rich and the big corporations, and we just turned the tables on them using this campaign finance system that they had designed to disempower the people. And we just turned it around with the internet. It was so cool. And we knew that that's what we were doing at the time. And it was the most exciting rush, you know? And so, so Dean, in the end, had raised something like $45 million. I can't remember. Just leaving Carrie and Edwards Unheard in the of. dust. Yeah. And, and he was pronounced the front runner. He was on the cover of all of the big news magazines two times and was just nonstop coverage about Dean. And the problem was that Dean's campaign forgot to organize Iowa. They forgot to, they, they got so whipped up in the internet that they, and this, they, that they forgot to actually get the votes they needed in Iowa, which of course is the first contest in the Democratic primary where you have to win. And so he came in fourth in Iowa, which is, an, there are only three tickets out of Iowa as the Clintons have made, have made famous. And, uh, and he did not even get one of those tickets. But then uh, t- on top of that, there was this scream do you remember the Dean scream? Absolutely. Yeah. So, and then they just played this scream on auto repeat. You know, every it was just on loop yeah. for ten days, and then, 
And he came way back up in New Hampshire, but anyways, he lost. So he lost the primary. But then I had to go... So then the Kerry campaign, they were like... That had mocked the internet. Like the can, the first inter, Kerry internet... I mean, sorry, the first Kerry campaign manager had mocked, you know, that not a single vote will be won on the internet. So stop talking no about way. the internet. We're not going to have this anything to do with this stupid internet thing. Yeah. 12 years ago, yeah. the <laughs> most, I assume, highly paid political experts in the country running yeah. the biggest campaign for president yeah. said the internet is irrelevant <laughs> yeah. for winning the presidency. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I see, know. This, you know, it's so interesting to me just listening to you now, and I'm thinking about how many of the listeners will resonate with this. It's interesting listening to you tell about an election in 04 and then thinking about this, the trauma in surreal nature of this election. It's Somehow I find it strangely comforting. Oh, we keep doing these every four years. Yeah. Like, however bad a person thinks it is, or however, yeah. ma- however much turmoil, bewilderment, disorientation, panic, Yeah. Um, these things keep coming. You know what I mean? Yeah, that is the wonderful thing about America, right? Is that we have really strong institutions that, and we we take them so for granted, and we have such high standards for them yeah. that we 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 tend not to be excited about them, but we really should be because they're so resilient. Right. And, and even like the pre- like so even much. like term limits, a president gets yeah. two terms, yeah, and nobody, and it's like that's how it is. And then you got to let somebody else. And you think about Russia, like Putin yeah. gets like fourteen terms or something, and then he. <laughs> And then he's like wants to stay in power, so he has somebody else be this position, and he does another position. Yeah. And it's like he just rearranges a couple chairs and then keeps going. Yeah. And in America, we'd be like, no, you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Like our our no, you can't. Do yeah. That. And we just keep getting better and better because the the two term thing didn't even happen until after Roosevelt. And even even though most people were really happy with Roosevelt, you know, and he won the war and everything, but they were like, you know, three terms felt a little weird. Let's make a rule that so that can't that. happen again. Okay, yeah. so where did somewhere though then post Kerry camp? I you and I met somewhere after Kerry campaign somewhere in there. Yeah, so after Kerry, so I was pretty. I was never a Democrat. I I, <laughs> I I was never a Democrat. In fact, it was really funny because you were too the far too far to the left. I was kind of yeah. I was a lefty, and the Democrats were too conservative. Oh yeah, and right wing for you. Yes, <laughs> yes, by light years. I mean, I didn't see any difference between the Democrats and the Republicans, <laughs> and uh, all the. Uh, there's a Robcast drinking game. When I say so good, everybody raises their glass, but we have to just pause and raise our glass to that. So good that you're like too far. That's just too no, far. No, yeah. Right. So, my, so I actually, I wasn't just poking fun at Bush, but um, but I... The whole establishment to you was well, like... Yeah, yeah like, like I actually, like when the Democrats lost all of these elections in 2002, I put up some, I put up a website called Angry Dems or something and I was like trying to incite the Democrats to, to riot and I was, and I and I had all these long screeds that I wrote about the cowardice of these, um, all these senators and Democratic Party leaders and calling out all of their misdeeds and, uh, and, and, and the problem was this was all still uh, findable on the internet when I was working on the Kerry campaign. So then, so there was actually this one meeting because I was actually like on the senior staff of the Kerry team because like we, I, my, my team raised half the budget for the Kerry campaign. So I was in all these like meetings. And so there was actually this, and I was in this meeting with like the chairman of the Democratic Party, Terry McAuliffe, <laughs> and like all these other big senior people. And then, and I'm looking at my Blackberry. We had Blackberries back then. And it was like, one of those blue blackberries with the real keyboard. Those were awesome. And then this email comes in and it's like, did it, and the subject line was, did you really write this? And it was from the communications director of the, of the campaign. And it, and it was like this, all these, you know, screeds against all like these guys. Like a college student on Reddit. Yes, just exactly. Slightly high. Yeah. <laughs> just going off. <laughs> right. On the man. Right. Raging right. against the machine. Cause and then I, it, yeah. Because I had done a petition to fire Terry McAuliffe. <laughs> you know, it was like a one line petition. You're Who fired. you're now working for. Right, who was the chairman of the Democratic Party. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I was like, yeah. And so it was really surreal, right? So I, so when I got out of the care... And you and, organized an online petition to have a guy fired who you then were months working... later. Is yeah, your boss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, yeah. So it was... <laughs> It all happened very quickly, you know, and I was like, "What's wow, this is crazy. So, but then I, the Kerry campaign was actually very disheartening. It confirmed everything I thought about the Democrats and the Democratic Party and how, 
people like there's a lot of great people in the Democratic Party, just like there are in the Republican Party and in any organization. But but like the the backbone and the kind of, you know, the 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 real culture of the organization was of people who really didn't they their their driving, you know, motivation was not the billions of people who were starving. Oh. You know, it was just a job. And it was really hard to find out, figure out why did they want to do this job that doesn't pay well, it has long hours. You have to put up with a lot of crap from really annoying people, and it doesn't pay well, and you're not really going to go anywhere. It's like a anywhere. spiritual question. Why are yeah. you paying this cost when you aren't in it yeah. for the big idea of helping lots of people? Yeah, and the people that so work on Why would on you the, endure this? Yeah, and the people that work on the campaigns, it's just like they want to be around the people who are the politicians on TV, because the, the people that work on the campaigns are generally another cast, you know, who don't ever get on TV or play a prominent role. And it's, you know, if occasionally, like if you happen to be the one person who runs the victorious presidential campaign, then you're, you've, then you write a book for $8 million and you go work for Uber as their communications director, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is actually what Pluff did. And then you have it made, but that's like, it's like your chances are worse than like actors in Los Angeles, you know? I mean, you know, it's oh, like got it, you're going to work at it. the coffee shop for the rest of your life. You know, you're yeah. just going to do this one yeah, dumb yeah. campaign job after another. Interesting. So I was just like, who are these people? Why are they doing this? And what is it all about? And it was just as bad as I had imagined it before I went in there. So I got out of there and I went and tried to figure out. Uh, and then that's when I became a Christian. <laughs> oh, no so, way. I yeah. did not see that coming. <laughs> I know. I didn't see it coming either. But... Um, <laughs> but yeah, but I, you know, I grew up in this, but I know I really left. I just left DC and I got, and I, I just left and I, and I really didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, where, what do we do here? You know, cause there was, didn't so seem to did be do? any movement to repair the world that was coming together, you know? And uh -huh. so, 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 well, so happily I got married. So I, I met this wonderful woman and um and and i and i moved down to north we lived in north carolina for a couple of years and uh when she was getting her phd and i was just making a living in various ways but yeah but the big thing that did have a huge impact on me was that i i i had never ever come in contact with christianity in my life i mean my my uh the closest way I had ever, my, the, like my, my closest brush with Christianity before this was in the graduate student lounge at U, UMass in Amherst. And the, for some reason, the Campus Crusade for Christ kids would come in and, and have a little study group in the corner in the graduate student lounge, which seemed like a weird place. Like maybe they were trying to come into the belly of the beast or something, but <laughs> into the lion's den, because it was like, you know, all these Marxists, you know, studying their capital and drinking their coffee and these kids were there and I remember overhearing some of the stuff they would talk about sometimes you know and they were like reading the bible talking about like greek translations and stuff like this and it was baffling to me anyways that was my nearest brush to christianity huh. but I had actually grown up with this so this is just a weird thing is that I grew up with this involuntary belief in god that I couldn't shake and it was like a superstition. And I just wrote it off as a superstition. But at eventually at a certain age, like when I was 30, I just embraced it as a, uh, as a, I, I finally just sort of like conceded that I, uh, for no rational reason, I believed that there was some God over the universe and that this God wanted to heal the world. And I just believed that. You know, and so, and I just took it as an article of faith and I just sort of like submitted to this superstition and it really changed my life. That was like the closest thing I ever had to one of those, you know, Baptist style con conversion experiences. Wow. And, and I remember the moment and it was like, I was just pretty down. This was before, you know, this is in the year 2000. And I just remember being really down about a lot of stuff that was going on and just being like, and I had tried, the thing is I had tried to sell out many times before in my life. You know, I, I was a techie, so I could go get a job as a computer programmer and make a lot of money, and I could have pursued a career in, you know, in a nice, comfy corporate environment, and the people were all really nice, but I would just get, I would go crazy, you know, because I would just be like, why the, but all the world is going to hell, and we're here, like, writing computer programs and managing money and 
this is just wrong. So I would literally go crazy and then I would start drinking too much at parties and getting into fights with people. So then I'd be like, okay, time to go back to the union. And so I would go back to union organizing. And, um, and so the way I got out of that loop is I finally just caved in to this irrational belief in a God that actually wanted to heal the world. And I said, yes, okay, God, I'm with you. And I'm glad you're there over the world. And I'm glad I'm on your team and we're going to heal the world. Let's go. And I'll do whatever you say. Although I had no idea, you know, I just sort of had this weird abstract idea of what God was saying. And, but that saved every, that changed everything. That's, I never fell into any depression again. And I really don't believe it in really that kind did. of thing. Yeah, I really I, don't, I don't believe I in that kind like, of uh, conversion thing. Like, and then I did this. And then I don't everything believe was great. in that thing. It's just that that's what happened. And it totally worked. And I never was depressed again. And I never wanted to kill myself again, which I really did want to do from time to time, you know, before. before and, um, and, I, and I was just fine, you know, from then on. And it was so great. And I just was like, yes. And it was this irrational leap of faith. And I knew what I was doing. And you know what's so ironic, actually? You'll love this. Is the thing that allowed me to take this leap of faith was my post my postmodern Marxian uh, philosophy professors um, who taught uh, Marx as a postmodern, you know, from a postmodernist perspective. And they taught us this epistemology of how all systems of knowledge are based on leaps of faith, you know? You know, like the turtles yeah. all the way down. Yes. And um, so, uh, yeah, so I... Everybody's leaping. Yes. You might as well leap in the direction of love, yeah. grace, sacrifice. Yeah. Especially if your whole head and heart are wired around that impulse anyways. If that's what moves you anyway. Yeah. And those are the stories that you are like, no, that's a good story. Yeah. And that's what actually does breathe life into you. Then you're going to leap. You might as well leap in that direction. Yeah. And oh, so then, so, fascinating. Yeah. So then, but then when I met my wife, who I met while I was working on the Kerry campaign, I, um, I I was really excited because we well okay well I was really excited because I met her <laughs> and she yeah. was awesome and I knew we were going to get married the minute I met her and but then when I got to know her more I was really excited because I was like oh you could take me to church now the reason I wanted to go to church was not because <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't know you could just go to church I had never been to church I mean I thought you had to like sign oh you sounds up like a country and, club like yeah. I, do are we members do I have a pass right you. Didn't to you the idea you could just show up at one was a new idea. I thought if I showed up, they would be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What are you what are you doing here? Yeah. You can't just come here. You know, you you know, do you believe you've in what we believe in? Because you literally never been to a church. Yeah. So <laughs> I know. So this is why I get on, you know, like cool Christians who are making their cool churches. I'm like, go put flyers up all over town. But because they're such hipsters, they're like, oh no, that would be so uncool. We don't like wanna ask anybody to come to our church, you know? <laughs> We're just going to, like, be there. I'm like, uh Okay, so I, it would have been great if somebody had put up some flyers that I might have seen. But, so yeah, so I was like, oh, you can take me to church. But actually, I did not want to go to church because I believed in God. Because I knew that Christians were crazy and <laughs> evil and believed in terrible things and, you know, wanted, you know, thought everybody was going to hell, wanted everybody to go to hell, probably thought they were going to hell. I just it just seemed like a hot mess and I didn't want to get involved in, right? <laughs> but it, it, but they were the ones who like elected George W. Bush twice. And there were these news stories with these crazy Christians with their hands in the air, you know, and their eyes yep. closed singing these one-line songs over and over again and so I was like I want to know what's going on with those people in the mega churches, you know? And so Elizabeth she was like, oh, Is that your wife? Yeah. Okay. So she was like, oh, no, I don't want to go back there. And <laughs> oh, yeah. She had never stopped going to church and was very, had a really strong, you know, vibrant faith. But, but she kind of, um, Kept she, going. She had, yeah, she, 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 she actually did go to like mainline churches. So I, I was going to, you know, I went along with her to this mainline church, but it was so boring. So I was like, no, this, whatever this is, I can't have anything to do with this. So let's go. I want to go see, I was like, I have two agendas. I want to see what those people are up to, and I want to see why they're electing Republicans and all this political power that they supposedly are organizing, and I just want to get to know more about them. And and so she said, okay, okay. So we went, and, and I when she told me we could, in fact, just walk into the place, we did. I was so nervous walking in. We, the first place we went to was Chapel Hill Bible Church, 
uh, in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And it was a 5,000 or 6,000 person little mini mega church, preppy, suburban, white people. Uh, and I sit down, I'm really nervous. We're sitting in the back row, you know, in case I have to make a getaway. And, um, and I mean, like I had been on Fox <laughs> news. I mean, part of it is like, I had been on like, you know, Fox news multiple times with like Sean Hannity saying I hated America and all this stuff. And like Bill O'Reilly had done like a 20 minute special on me and how evil I was. Honest to God, you know, and so, so I was a little, I mean, I literally was worried that somebody was going to recognize me and that, that, and I, I had a vision of like everybody in the church standing up and turning around and looking yeah, at you and pointing being like you, what are you doing? Get him. And, um, I know it sounds crazy, but that's really what I, to, to some people, but that's really, really kind of what was going through my mind. So sit down. Okay. So I, they give you this bulletin, this, they give you this little two, two pager bulletin, as you know, um, and 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 the title of the sermon was Two Fists in the Face of Empire. And he was now I didn't know about any of this stuff at the time, but he was preaching on um uh Brian Walsh and Cynthia Keysmaths. Uh, oh, that Colossians, Colossians remixed, remixed on yeah. how the fundamental premise of a lot of the New Testament is resistance to empire. Yes. This is the the original stick it to the man. Yes. Like subvert that thing. Yes. So oh. can you imagine? Can you imagine me who had been like you know through labor two organizer an- Marx? Yeah, yeah, two anti-war movements that failed because my lefty progressive anti-war movement was so countercultural and weird. And you go into a church, and the sermon is about an anti-war. Yeah, these because t- these texts yeah. are really dangerous. Yeah, they're so far left; they're not even left. Yeah, texts. Yeah. that are right there in the New Testament saying the Jesus movement is about subverting this dominant coercive military power. Man, I can get fired up about this. I know. And so were you just were you, were you just blown away? I was dizzy. Cuz you were like if these people read their <laughs> own book they yeah. would act very differently. But in the and world. they were reading it. That's the but what didn't make any sense is they were reading it and the guy on stage was preaching about it's anti-imperialist nature. And he wasn't pulling punches. And this was 2005. So we were two years into the Iraq war. Yeah. And he was condemning the Iraq war and condemning the American empire. And he was doing it in a way that was keeping all these people with him. And they were embracing what he was saying and they were applauding it. And he wasn't saying down with imperial American imperialism, you know, you know, we must now go on a march, you know, or anything. He was like, he was like, look, everybody, this is what Jesus is telling us. This is what the Bible is like telling this us. thoughtful, yeah. reasoned, yeah. passionate, there's a better way. Yeah. And he was like, hey, oh. maybe we've gone, you know, maybe we have been doing the wrong thing. You know, maybe we've not been thinking about some of these things. And so he was really, and they were going with him, you know. And then, uh, and so, so then I was like, wow. I mean, I was dizzy. I didn't know how to put it, put it together, but I, I knew he must have been preaching from something. So I went and looked up the phrases that ah. he said, and I got, and which got me to Brian Walsh's book. And then, and then I did some more Googling. It got me to your books. It got me to Velvet Elvis, <laughs> which I listened to ah. immediately. And, um, <laughs> And I, you and were then, way down the rabbit hole at that point. Yeah, and my, I'm like 13 uh, layers down yeah. in the rabbit hole. Oh, <laughs> uh, and then so my whole, uh, so we kept going to this church, you know, and I, and then I did sort of have another, I sort of had a second conversion experience because I was like, come on, I can believe in a big abstract, you know, energy god, you know, like yeah. that's fine, Jedi force. Yes, exactly. I mean, I was perfectly prepped to believe in that. And um, I mean, the funny thing is, I was also kind of prepped to believe in the Christian God because A grew up in America, but <laughs> but B, um, although I never ever heard anybody talking about Christianity, um, but then because because where I grew up was so atheist, but then but but I did go to this nursery school that was run by nuns, and I suspect that Sister Anastasia because I I did have the Bible stories in my head oh, from Sister Anastasia, and then the other thing, the other influence was. Remember when we only had three channels? Yeah. Uh, so, and and early on Sunday morning, the only thing that was on any of those channels was the televangelists. So you'd have heard some of that. I, well, I, wo- I woke up, I was an early riser, and what I would turn on the Vitamix TV. What a weird Vitamix blend you I are know. Of, of influences. But, though, you know, but I went back and watched some of those guys just out of curiosity, because I really remember watching them. And I used to do, like, 
impersonations of them that would like my mother would have tears running down her face because I was so funny and I'd be like healing my little sister, you know, and <laughs> you're healed, you know. But I think I but they did preach the gospel, you know, in between fundraising pitches and all kinds of other crazy stuff. So I think I actually did absorb a lot of the Bible story there too. And the and that's the amazing thing about the Bible is that is that um and I know this is such heresy from where I come from. And I mean, I was just on the phone earlier today with somebody and uh, t- talking about this, and they were just like, "You're crazy. The Bible is about telling people to kill each other and be greedy, and that you're going to hell." And but what what the amazing thing is that <laughs> the, that's yes. such a massive misreading. <laughs> I can't even believe it. I know, but but that but but it, but the reason that misreading is out there is because for two thousand years. These empires and states have been uh, taking it and, first of all, banning it, you know, and saying, oh, you can't read it, while at the same time co opting it and yep. making it a state religion and, and telling, ba- and essentially telling everybody that what it does tell you is to kill everybody else. And because then it's that much easier to, to justify your own yeah. killing, yeah. <laughs> unjust use of power yeah. and violence. Yeah. So, um, so I, so my next little. Well, I was a little bit, you know, so then I, I sat there and I listened to these sermons where, where and, and this is what people who don't go to these churches, this is what I did not know before I went to church, is that what they do in church, in most churches, is they actually teach the Bible. It's like going to a graduate seminar in ancient studies, and except it's way more engaging and exciting because, um, because this pastor is actually, especially, you know, is actually like, keeping people coming every week voluntarily, you know? And so... Because we want, we want to learn about the world. We want to be challenged. We want to make sense of things. Yeah. Like, this is a basic human desire. Yes. But, but, what, but what I found, what blew me away, and that I just could not get my head around, I mean, I had to keep going back to, to this church over and over again so that I could believe my eyes, so I could believe what I was seeing, wow. which was that, this, that the preacher was preaching ancient te- ancient Hebrew yeah. texts texts you know and ancient Greek texts and and like actually getting into the nitty-gritty because I I used to laugh at how Christians didn't know that they were reading this book that had been through many translations yeah, and been and, edited together yeah. and people left out certain things and right. included other things and, and yeah because I remember like I think you know I remember somebody telling me like no Christians believe that like the Bible was like written by God through people, like when the people wrote it down, it was like God took over their bodies and they wrote it out, and so it was like exactly what God said. And they don't even know that there are all these contradictions. Christians like don't believe that, actually. I know. Well, that's <laughs> what was amazing. So, so all of these, you know, suburban Christians sitting in, you know, yuppie suburban Christian people who I had been raised to demonize, um, who, by the way, like looked exactly like and acted exactly like the people I grew up with in my subculture. You know, it it was kind of like Canadians and, and Americans. You know what I mean? <laughs> Look the same, sound the same, totally different. You know, so um, Serbs and Croats. You know, same thing. So, so these, so these, uh, so yeah. So what amazed me was that what the preacher was teaching them was: here's how they stitched this Bible together. Here's what it actually meant in the old. Yeah. In the different languages, here Jesus was coming from this one language, but talking to everybody in this other language, and so this is what he meant here. And you know, there's there's all these different versions of the gospel, and here's here's how we have to make sense of that. And so I was like, whoa, these people are 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 like all these like normal people who are supposed to be stupid. They're sitting here in a graduate level seminar, and they're handling on philosophy. some dangerous stuff. Because if yeah. you take this seriously, yeah you're going to act differently, you're going to vote differently, you're going to buy differently, you're going to think about people who aren't like you differently. Like, this is actually really, really world-changing, life-changing, dangerous stuff that you're listening to and being exposed to. Yeah. And it was so... So so what I thought I was witnessing, actually, and I got so excited about it around 2005 to 2010, is... And I basically spent a lot of time... I even traveled all around the country. I even got a grant to like go study Christians, you know, and uh, <laughs> cause that's the kind of thing you do when you come out of the progressive world. And, um, and I, um, I wrote a blog called Revolution in Jesus Land actually for a while that actually got a lot of it. it, it the whole, it was written to 
like my atheist friends, but to explain to them what I was seeing, but none of them ever read it because it was just sort of too, too much cognitive dissonance, you know, yeah. they just couldn't huh. believe what I was saying. And so a few read it, but most didn't. And, but it developed a following among Christians actually, who were just like tickled that to see themselves through this weird lens that I was seeing them in. And, um, and, and so, but what, yeah, what I, what, but so what I thought I was seeing was, and I think actually what was happening is that there was this revolution happening within the church and it was, um, it was leaders like you and like Shane Claiborne, who, I mean, another one of the these crazy experiences that I couldn't get my, that I had to pinch myself about was he did the, um, litany of resistance in, uh, you know, that litany of resistance, it was, he wrote it with a Iraq war vet and also with Brian Walsh. And it's this like Catholic style litany. And if you read it, it's like the most, just Google it audience. It's just Google litany of resistance. Shane and, Claiborne litany of resistance. And just read that whole thing. And now imagine Shane Claiborne standing up there in a stadium of 14,000, mostly Southern Baptist male preachers, uh, you know, pastors, and imagine him with everybody on their feet chanting back in the litany, we will not comply, uh, and Lord have mercy, and uh, to his phrases, which was like, you know, with the, you know, with the, you know, with the, uh, I can't even remember, you know, with the riches of empire, we will not comply, you know, with the, something of militarism, we will not comply, and it gets more and more and more radical, and I look around, and I see two of these guys, there were two guys in my field of vision who were pastors at some Georgia church, you know, this is like the suburbs of, of Atlanta, with tears streaming down their face as this was happening, and this was, and he did, he started the litany after doing a whole sermon about, um, serving the Eucharist, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Through the wall on the Mexico border, you know, to immigrants who were trying to get over the wall, trying to get across, who wanted to come over. And, 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 and talk, you know, talking about, um, you know, talking about poverty in America, you know, and um, he was wearing a shirt that said, God loves women preachers, which was actually, which was obviously heresy. And he had a full head of dreadlocks, you know, still back then. And he's up there, you know, with clothes that he had sewn himself, you know, like so some in- kind of Gandhi. And, he, and there are people on their feet chanting this and being deeply moved. And that was at this Catalyst conference in, I forget what year, and maybe this starts 2009. To open, this start, you start to realize that there is all sorts of new things might be possible. Yeah, I really, it, it, it was possible. And I saw, and I, I, like this Catalyst Conference where Shane did that, it was this three-day solid Christian mega stadium thing, you know, that makes the hipster Christian sick. But it was nonstop anti-consumerism, you know, anti-racism, you know, anti-objectification of women. You know, it was a full, I mean, to me, it was like, total full-on deconstruction of everything that was bad about our, you know, consumer-obsessed society and uh, power-obsessed society. And they were, and, and, and again, it was like, it was so similar on so many, in so many ways. It was like, it was just such a better version of like the best of the left. Because the left is speaking in a language that nobody else can understand except like the 5,000 attendees of the Socialist Scholars Conference. You know, <laughs> and I, I don't know why I said 5,000. It's like 900, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, but these guys were speaking in the language of Christianity of that everybody people. can understand. Yeah. And I shouldn't say everybody, but that half of America understand and that half of America feel very, very strongly. Okay. About. I feel like what you're describing now, knowing what you're up to now, it feels like seeds were being planted then for you well, I had of the, where you went from there. Well, it, this was, it was one of these things where I, because as a, as a labor organizer, I was going all over the South and the Midwest. So I got out of my suburban mm-hmm. upper middle class bubble intentionally. It's part of why I did it. And, and so I, I was hanging out with Amer- Americans of all backgrounds and yeah. classes. And I saw that the American people were radical and ready for change and were good. I did, what I didn't see sitting in their living rooms talking about their jobs was I didn't see this other part of their lives of the church and Christianity and their faith. So, so there was, was, was a dimension I just, I, 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 I picked up the references. I could see that they were Christian, but I wrote it off as this stupid thing that they did because they were brainwashed and because, mm. 
because the church had infected everybody's brains and made them believe all this crazy stuff. So I was like, well, maybe when they join the union and when we have the revolution, they'll get over their Christianity and, it, you know, we'll be, well, then things will be okay. So I didn't realize, you know, so, so, so I, I already believed that all of America was awesome and that we could unify around a really bright future. But I had no idea that Christianity and the church was part of that equation. So, so, so imagine my excitement when I realized that actually the church and Christianity, this thing that, that really, you know, was the primary thing in like half of America's life was actually an incredible force for, for change and good. And, uh, and I think it still is even, you know, but what, what was really interesting in that moment from like 05 to 10 was there was this rising movement when like all kinds of really like, I want, you know, I was sort of this like curiosity among, among these Christians, you know? So, because I was like, yeah, I'm like from move on and democratic politics, you know? And they were like, oh, very interesting. And then, so I got into all these interesting conversations with people. So I was, I wound up at these dinners with all these like, you know, very mainstream and conservative, um, you know, megachurch pastors and people like that. And who were like looking for a way to join this revolution, and they were and they were trying to find a way to navigate, you know the, the you know the the reservations that their um, parishioners were having. Parishioners is one of those words that actual <laughs> Christians don't use. But I it's I, I I have not actually been able to like switch over to the Christian vocabulary. But like but they're you know the so they they they're you know they had they were trying to figure it out right. And then I figure I feel like. Things then happened. I don't really understand it, but like from 2010 onward, that moment kind of fell apart a little bit. And, okay, so you yeah. worked on the Obama campaign. Yeah, I did some stuff in the general because I, I, I missed the, I really kind of missed the Obama primary because I was trying to get away from politics. I was like, damn, all that stuff. But then, but then like <laughs> Barack Obama won. And so I was like, ah. So I got involved and I did some interesting tech projects around field organizing in the general election and. A lot yeah. of my friends worked on that campaign. Then let's fast forward to Bernie. Yeah, so then I I, uh, I went to Bernie uh, because I realized it was going to be another one of these amazing movements like Obama. And and during the Obama primary, I wrote about his movement. I, I went all around and observed it, and it was this amazing thing. We learned a lot from it that we put to work in the Bernie campaign. So when Bernie announced that he was running and these huge crowds started forming, I realized, yes. And you were at the center of that campaign again. I um I was I was one of the people that yeah that that did a bunch. The the thing about the Bernie campaign is there was no center, you know. Oh, interesting. <laughs> there was yeah it was because remember I was how I said campaigns are crazy and chaotic, so the Bernie campaign was Bernie going around and doing these huge events, and then it was our campaign manager on TV arguing with reporters and Clinton people. And then it was a couple of really amazing field leaders running our Iowa and New Hampshire campaign. And there was a bunch of other amazing teams. There was, there was the advance team that ran those huge stadium rallies that was amazing, an amazing team. Um, and then, and then uh, myself and uh, a friend of mine named Claire Sandberg, who joined the campaign with me, um, the two of us uh, built out this team, and then we were really lucky when Becky Bond joined us, who's an old uh, colleague of mine, uh, we've known each other for a long time. And so we built out this team that basically organized the volunteers in all of the later states that presidential campaigns usually don't care about. But, you know, from 2008, we learned that those states actually are the ones that wind up mattering a whole lot. So mm -hmm. you have to have victory in some of those first early states to keep but you your have campaign to endure going. the whole way through. Yeah, which didn't used to be true or if it was true, you know, you couldn't it didn't you didn't, you weren't you, you weren't going to have any money. Like in Gore's, you know, in 2000, nobody thought about those later states because you don't have any money by that after after New Hampshire. And but because of the internet and this avalanche of money that we brought into politics, now you could fight all the way through. So so my team was sort of out there on you know, on the fringe of the Bernie campaign with 46 states that the official campaign really didn't care about organizing. And, uh, and so we knew that they were eventually going to care. And, uh, and so we, uh, and what we really wanted to do was to show that volunteers could organize themselves, um, you know, and that we could basically give leadership positions to volunteers 
as though they were staff and build out a real structure that was powerful. And with the help of hundreds of thousands of Bernie volunteers, we did that. Like actual power to the people. Yeah. And we, and in a presidential campaign, you actually have to power means affecting votes. And so we, so the, the main thing we did was we built this huge phone banking operation. And so we, in the end, there were a hundred thousand phone banking events, volunteer led phone banking events where people would get together in a back house like this and they'd get some chips and beer and they would make calls. And we gave them the technology to do that. And we gave them an organizing platform to get together to do that. And then we worked out this sort of um, revival style organizing technique, which was actually truly inspired by revivals. And we actually did an altar call and, uh, and we called people down <laughs> and we lined them up in front of the room and we, and, and we were like, thank you. These guys are going to lead the phone banking events. Now everybody else get up and sign up for their events. And we, and, and, and we had this whole dance that we worked out. It was like a real technique that worked. And so, um, and, and so if we got 200 people in a room in one of these organizing meeting revival things, two, those 200 people, like at least 180 of them would wind up showing up to multiple phone banking shifts over and over and over. So we, wow. so we made 81 million calls was the final number. Uh, volunteers made 81 million calls to voters uh, in this distributed phone banking crazy experiment. Oh, the yeah. scale just yeah. blows my mind. Yeah, and we and the the really frustrating thing is that we only scratched the surface um, because you know the whole thing started late. It was you know because the campaign didn't care about these later states until they counted. Um, they didn't give us resources up front, and uh, so we had to. Uh, you know, really just kind of put it together with scotch tape and glue. And so if we had won the primary, we would have been able to turn that into this huge thing. I mean, we, every single American would have gotten a call from a Bernie volunteer five times. And they would have been trained. And I mean, it would have been crazy. And that's what's going to happen next time. Because now, because we actually, so Becky Bond and I wrote a book about it. It's called uh, Rules for Revolutionaries. And it came out in November. And it's... Uh, and it's, Rules for Revolutionaries. Yes. How big organizing... Zach Exley can, and Becky Bond. Yes. Becky Bond. Bond. Uh, yeah. Big, how, big organize, how Big Organizing Can Change Everything. That's the subtitle. And it's... And, it, and, and this so is we, the front edge. This is the very front edge of this. Yes. And so, the, so, when, when, the, so when there's... You know, in 2020, there's going to be an insert... There's gonna, we're going to have the same dance all over again because the Democrats have really made this into a pattern. So there's going to be the establishment candidate who's going to be boring. And he's going to try to win <laughs> by saying that they're like just a little bit better than Donald Trump. They're like, you know, and just a little bit better than, you know, oh, this is fascinating Barack Obama. Or so a you bit already worse know how it will unfold. Yeah, there's going to be some establishment candidate. There'll be five establishment candidates that will get winnowed down to one, which will probably be the tallest. And, uh, and then, <laughs> <laughs> and with the nicest hair. And then there'll be some insurgent. And if we're, you know, if we're lucky, there'll be some insurgent who says, this is crazy. You know, we need to really rebuild our economy and reform all of our institutions. Who's with me? Let's do it. And then that person, if they can string two sentences together, will be able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. They'll outraise the establishment people. The establishment people will spend, just like Hillary Clinton did, the establishment people will spend half their time in small meetings with very rich people. Um, and you can listen to these recordings that got out of Hillary Clinton having these conversations with the rich people at these. Uh, I, I think Hillary Clinton is very nice. I'm not like anti Hillary Clinton. I just think that she's got this ideology that's wrong, which is like, hey, rich people run the world and that's just the way it goes and we better do whatever they say. And so she spent all her time with them. And, and you can hear her like having these conversations, you know, saying, yeah, the way you guys are running the world is fine. I'm sorry that I have to like say slightly mean things about you every now and then, you know, but like there's this guy Bernie and so cut me some slack. And, uh, and that so might be the bus analysis. I guarantee people are listening to that thing you just did right there. Like that's like the best analysis I've of heard. why of, she didn't uh, I think get it's enough just, votes it's in those just states. incredibly yeah. illuminating. Yeah. Your perspective on that. Okay. Now, yes. okay. Is this like drum roll now? What do we got to do to save the world right now? Yeah. Yes. So tell, please, this, I feel like, I feel, I wish I had like a da-da-da-da. Now, what's the thing? What's <laughs> um, the thing? Okay, so 
I think the thing is, I've actually been on this for a really long time, and I have seen. I've just. I'm. I feel like the pieces are all falling into place, and um, it's the thing is, we we ha we live in this wonderful country with a democracy, and so let's use the democracy to take over the government. That's what it's here for. That's what you know. The founders of the Republic, you know, were so, so you excited want to take about. over the government. Yeah, and let's take over the government through elections, and 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 let's and 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 we and and this internet is partly what makes this new approach to taking over the government in one fell swoop possible. So what we're doing, so so I work with a group of people. Uh, a lot of us met on the Bernie campaign, but it's a lot of non-Bernie people too. Um, and it's uh, and we're volunteers, and I'm the only one in the group right now that even has a background in politics. Everybody else is good, normal people, you know, and <laughs> and it's actually a majority uh, women group. It's a majority people of color group, actually, and um, it's a it really really represents you know America, and we have this idea that we're working on where we're recruiting, we're handpicking 400 candidates to challenge 400 incumbents in 2018 in the 2018 congressional elections. There's 469 seats up for re-election in 2018, and we're going to challenge at least 400. Wait, 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 wait. 400 and how many? There's 469 There's going to be an election in two years for Congress seats. Yes. There's 469 of them, but over 400 of them... We're going to challenge. With candidates that you get from where? That we get from the Robcast, for one thing. So everybody needs to go to brandnewcongress.org and uh, so when this is over and, so you, and nominate somebody that you know. I'll tell you who we're looking for. But yeah, we're going to... We're gonna, you're we're, looking for yeah. candidates to run in these 400 elections yeah. to take over the government and take it back. Yes. And we're going to run the campaign. So we're going to do this like a presidential campaign. So all these presidential campaigns that I've worked on... And you've on, actually worked on presidential yes, campaigns. Yes, yes. And, and, we're, and we're attracting, you know, in this new crazy world where, you know, what, all this crazy stuff that happened just happened, there's a lot of people who were not taking me seriously on this idea, people with a lot of experience. Because a guy who doesn't know anything yeah. with a Twitter account won the presidency. So all of a right. sudden your ideas about this actually wonderful woman who runs a business could make a great... Yes. representative. Yes. That was a crazy idea until somebody with n no policy knowledge or n right. n who just tells lies with a Twitter account wins the presidency. Suddenly your idea, I'm yeah. getting really cranked up about this. Doesn't seem so crazy. So, yeah. so let's take a woman in Ohio who that drives a minivan and she runs a flower business. I don't know. She No, she runs a bank. She whatever. Yeah. You're saying... Flower business would be great. Bank would be great too. She yeah. has a bakery. She, I don't know, whatever. We, we have criteria. You're saying she would make a wonderful representative. Yeah, so we actually, we're not saying anybody can make a good representative. We have criteria. Okay, good. And our criteria are that you need to be somebody who does the work of running America. And, you know, uh, this could be is everything from stay-at-home mom or dad to, you know, somebody that runs a daycare center to small flower business person, to small bank person, to a big bank person, as long as they, you know, are with us on what we want to do policy yes. wise, and um, veterans, teachers, engineers, uh, you know, school principals, right? So they need to do the work of running America. Can you imagine? You know, something like eighty percent of the people in Congress are lawyers who haven't even practiced law in like three decades because they've just been sitting in state legislatures and Congress for the last 30 years. That's what our Congress looks like today. Imagine... What, what percent? It's like 80% are lawyers. Who don't practice law. Yeah, because, I mean, because, you know, most of them have been politicians for decades. Yeah. So, so how do they know anything about what we're going through out here? So when they dealt with healthcare reform, for example, none of them knew anything about healthcare. So just imagine if we had like 30 people in Congress who were healthcare workers and physicians and people that had worked in health insurance companies. Imagine, Business owners who had yeah. actually tried yes. to get good health insurance for their employees and yes. been like, ah! Yes. A friend of mine just recently was telling me about it's awful. How yeah. hard it has been just to provide great health insurance because of this or that or yeah. this. 
And this, yeah, it's awful. So, so brand so just, new Congress. Yeah. So just imagine people that actually do the work of running America. Okay, the criteria is they have to be good at what they do. Yeah. And so they, so the people around them, they need to be like, she is such an awesome teacher. You know, she mentors other teachers. She, her, she loves so her kids so much. So some basic character witnesses who go, this yeah. person lives it. Yeah. So they're the kind of person who should be leading. Yeah. Okay. And it's and then the other criteria. So they so they they do the work of running America and they're good at it. And then the second criteria is that they have shown in their life that they're really for other people. They're sacrificial people. They you know they really want to live for others, and they just have over and over in their life turned down the promotion. You know, and, and and one of the people that really helped us get Brand New Congress started, she's a teacher, and uh, she's been a teacher for 26 years. She's got the degree to become an administrator, and she can never bring herself to do it because she loves her kids too much. So she could she could she could be making a lot more money and retire with a way bigger pension, and she just can't bring herself to do it. So people like that, and so we're so we're we're just so the crazy so we, so we actually have a stat we've raised when we we announced this idea and. A lot of people were like, we love that idea. And they actually donated enough money so that we could pay a staff. So we took some of the people that were working at, uh, you know, as volunteers and we, you know, who would, would rather do this full time and we hired them. So we have five staff people who are just looking for these candidates all day long. And it's really hard. And, 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 it's, and then, and it's so, it's so amazing because when we, when, when we find these people and we're just like Googling all day, you know, like we're just searching like teacher of the year, you know, like engineer Are you really? in Roanoke. Yeah. Yeah. We're just like Wait, okay, random okay. searching. So you, like, let's think about this historically. You have been at the center of the most well-funded campaigns in the history of humanity at the center of these historic moments. And you're now telling us, because you have a long <laughs> track record of being a step ahead, uh-huh. you're now telling us this is the future. And, yes. the, and the people who, are, who have a proven track record, you and your peeps, your crew, you're literally Googling Teacher of the Year <laughs> yeah. in Des Moines, yes. trying to find the kind of person who is the kind of person who should help take over the government. Yes. <laughs> I know it's absurd, and we, you know, and we thought it was really interesting because we we thought, and weirdly, the Trump campaign has odd has, in a weird way, bolstered your cause. Yeah, because well, in first an upside of all, down kind yeah, of way. well, for, be, yeah, because it makes it seem like yeah, this is actually a reasonable thing to do, but also because people are like, I really don't like this the, the direction we're going in, and so we need to do something, and just like trying to elect more Democrats. More democratic politicians right, right, right. isn't going to do it. Like just you know, just trying to like go go blue team. You know, no, like the blue team is it completely just bankrupt, back and, forth and the red team is bankrupt. Yeah, so yeah, it bounces back and forth. It's ridiculous. So people are ready for a complete change. And but you know what's interesting is that um, the reason why the recruitment is taking so long, and it's actually taking longer than we hoped it would take. So we really need you guys out there who are listening to go to brandnewcongress.org. And click on nominate or go to brandnewcongress.org slash nominate and nominate the amazing person that fits the description I just gave. But the, it's really interesting. The, everybody knows 10 people who fit these criteria. But the, but, it, but the amazing thing is if you sit down and try to get somebody to, to give you those 10 people, it's really hard to get them to do that because, they're, because they have those good people in one part of their brain that's completely separate from the part of their brain that imagines politicians. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, so, yeah. Oh, this is so interesting. So they won't suggest the good people to run for Congress because it's almost like they can't imagine thinking this, them in the same breath as politicians. Well, it's interesting. My, I mean, everything that drives my work is that everything is spiritual. So, like, uh-huh. my life work is essentially introducing people to the depth of everyday life. Uh-huh. Like cooking, running your business, taking care of your body, art. It's all, it's all grounded in, in depth, which is another word for that is spiritual. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Like yeah. just showing that I'm not talking about something that's over here in the yeah. corner. But, you're, but it's I'm hard for people to put those things together. talking about like, oh, how wait, you what? engage. Spirituality right. means how you engage with the fullness of life. But I've noticed over the years the number of people who are like, wait, wait, wait. Yes, right. I thought you were talking about Sunday morning, which is why I don't even... Not even in churches anymore, yeah, that's simply so because it's exactly. I'm not interested thing. in building yeah. a temple. I'm interested in announcing the whole thing as a temple. That's so interesting, right? And so you're yeah. coming to people with politics, and they're like, "Oh yeah, politics," and you're going, "No, politics." I've done a bunch of podcasts on it's our shared common life together. Politics is about how we arrange ourselves. Yes, and that's about roads, and that's about 
businesses, and right. that's about tech. Oh, right, exactly. I, they can't I get it. make the connection. I get it. I get right, it. I and get it's it. the same. Like you, you have to get up in front of people and do this two-hour really powerful thing. I get to, and they're still, <laughs> and and they're still not quite getting you're it. Just, so they need just, to read your book and listen to your podcast for two years, and then they're like, oh, I mean, that's how it was so for that's me. That's what you are facing. So, is you're like yeah. introducing people to a completely new way of thinking about this. Is don't think about politics as something that happens over there. Right. Politics is right here, and this person here is actually what we're looking for. Yes, and so oh, it's really man. hard for people. I know it. They so when I so when when we so so we're so we so we people nominate. We got two thousand nominations right away uh, when we announced this idea because there was a lot of energy from Bernie people that knew us, you know, and and virtually all of those nominations were the exact wrong kind of person. They were almost all of them were like state rep. You know who's been gunning for their own career. You know, and they they're they're progressive. You know, because the Bernie folks are all progressive. So here we have a progressive state rep who really wants to run for Congress, and they they're they're good on all the issues according to these Bernie fans. But like this person has never done anything for anybody else. They've never served their community. You know what I mean? It's like people so, were people were like nominating. This is like a really good horse and buggy because the horse can run far and the buggy's got like a nice smooth ride. And you're like, no, we're making a car. Yeah, we exactly. don't want right. <laughs> really good versions right. of the old thing. Yeah, we want a completely. That's it. It's the difference yes. between transition and change. Yeah, yeah. is change is like constant mod little modifications to the existing thing. Transition is chucking the existing thing. And building yeah. a whole new thing. Yeah, oh, so, so interesting. Yes. So we're so we're working full time doing this recruitment. We have this team of people that have, we you know we all get it and we know what we're doing. If and what we really actually need is we need volunteers to like commit. Like we 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 think we can find a good candidate. It takes about three or four hours to find to to find a good candidate. Basically, just by searching. You know, and 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 another good way to do it is to call an organization, like to call a local union or to call the, you know local chapter of the Society of Civil Engineers or the Society of Black Engineers and to um, and to just have this. But the problem is when you call the organization, you have to have this conversation and they're like, you mean politicians? And you're like, no, no. So you have to go through this whole thing. It takes a lot of work. So it takes about three or four hours of work to get one good candidate, no matter how you do it. And so we need some volunteers who will commit three or four hours a week to find one candidate a week, and we need to grow out that team. And we need to do this fast because we, we want to announce our whole slate. Okay, so back to the idea of how this will actually work. So that's the criteria of the candidates. But, we, <laughs> but when we find the 400, when we have these 400 together, and, and we're doing 400 because we assume there's at least 60 or 70 in there that are good already. You know, There are some good people in there. And so we don't want to challenge them. So imagine these 400 amazing people standing on the Capitol steps, you know, in like April of 2017. So that's in just mm -hmm. a couple of months, sure. right? So, um, so, so imagine them announcing and the press will give them a little bit of coverage and the press will laugh at us just like they were laughing at Howard Dean. And so they'll laugh. And when they're laughing, I mean, we've already raised $300,000 in small donations, just and like nobody's even heard of us so it's you know people are into this idea so so when they're laughing when they do their little coverage about this wacky group of people doing this silly thing we'll raise millions of dollars and then the press will cover the story and then they'll say you know those wacky people we told you about last week they raised five million dollars last week and by that time we'll have ten million dollars and then what we'll do is we'll build out this thing which a bunch of us know how to do which is we'll build a president a national presidential style campaign and the and the candidates and so the other thing that people have trouble understanding about this idea is they're like, oh, well, running for Congress, so that means that the candidate will have to quit their job and get a headquarters and hire a bunch of staff and learn how to run a campaign. And no, they're not going to have to do any of that. We're going to, we have this, or we have this organization that is going to run all of their campaigns in one block. And this is another thing where Trump actually kind of helps us because um, nobody could believe this, nobody took this seriously until Trump. Because all the political professionals would just laugh at me when I would tell them this idea, but now they're not laughing because Trump just became president without any campaign organization almost. Right. And because he made a direct connection to the people and delivered this really powerful message, it was 
you know, it was like two thirds a really hateful message, but <laughs> it was it was a very powerful message. It was powerfully hateful. Yes, yeah. and uh, and and then um, so we're going to deliver a very powerful message, which is not hateful, and which is like here's how we're going to rebuild the economy, reform our institutions, fix our justice system, make life awesome in America. And um, here's, you know, and, and, uh, and we're not going to go to every Democratic neighborhood club. Like, there's, there's all this stuff that congressional candidates do that you would never imagine doing. Like, and yeah. when you become a congressional candidate, there are all these people that tell you you have to do all these things. So you just and go do, you don't yeah. have to do any of them. Yeah. You no, don't we're not actually do, have to do yeah, them. Yeah, we're not going to do them. And, and it's the same way, and Trump, you know, is a good example. He didn't do any of the stuff you're supposed to do, and he won. And so, uh, so what could yeah. decent, hardworking, honest, moral, sacrificial, loving, inclusive people do mm-hmm. if that could be done with that yes. many hate and lies and bigotry and yeah. misogyny and racism? Yes. What could be done with like, ah, uh, and Trump with brand all new that, Congress? Yeah, and Trump. Trump mobilized this tiny minority of people and then you know only a quarter of 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 the adult population voted for Trump and and only like 10% of that population was really excited about him and i live in the buckle of the bible belt and i live in a really republican town and and about 10% of our town was excited about Trump and uh, everybody else voted republican because they vote republican and because you know and and uh, they they weren't super excited about him and so we're and and I think that the just as much for every vote that Trump turned out by promising to deport 11 million of our neighbors, he um, kept a vote home because people were offended by that or were offended yeah. by all of his, yeah. you know, all, bragging about last, attacking women and yeah, all this stuff. Long. So 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 we um, yes. Yeah, so I agree exactly with your with what with what you just said is that this, that's the whole idea is that just imagine. If we were just as fearless, and it's like that, you know, as Trump, like Trump was totally one hundred percent fearless. And when his campaign told him to shut up and be careful and not be himself, he, you know, said a giant "f you" to all of them, and he just yeah. said, "I'm going to just be myself." And and if and he was and so imagine if we're that fearless with a message about how about how everybody in America matters. And about how we love that we live in a multiracial society that welcomes immigrants and that's been built on immigrants, and that you know, and 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 actually, and a message that's not just like I'm going to build you some beautiful factories, you're going to love them, you know. <laughs> but but what if we actually said, hey, America, we're going to rebuild the economy. Here's how, you know, and with some just as common sense of, uh, but you know, and actually lay out a, a convincing plan. Because I don't think anybody that voted for Trump believed he's going to build any factories. I just think that voting for him gave them a way to say, you know what, establishment, you've destroyed our means of making a living for the past 40 years, and we've been angry about that, and you've never once talked about it. And this guy's talking about it, and so I'm going to vote for him just out of protest. So imagine if we talked about that and put down a plan to rebuild the economy. Um I, you know, in a way that would work for everybody. So, I, yeah, I think it's going to be huge. And I think that, and I think that people, you know, Congress has like a 13% approval rating last time I checked. And yet the, the percent, the percentage of the incumbents that get reelected is like 90%. So how does that make sense? So there's the, the you know, you know, like arbitrage, you know, like there's a, uh, there's a big trading opportunity here. You know, we can, <laughs> we can trade out the yes. people because they're, nobody yeah. wants them in there. And so if we put, but but at the same time, nobody nobody cares about their local congressperson running. Like nobody knows who their local congressperson is, and nobody knows when the primaries are. So so if we turn this into a giant national campaign, and 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 we'll be provocative, you know, and we'll get covered the same way that not only Trump but also Bernie got covered, you know, because we're going to be really shaking it up. So we'll get coverage, and through this big national movement where we'll raise hundreds of millions of dollars. We will make sure, you know, to, to run a real professional campaign, we'll make sure that everybody that wants a change knows where and when to vote. That was what we did really well on the Bernie campaign. And um, obviously not well enough, but <laughs> but we got him from, you know, 0% name recognition to 
getting 46% of the delegates. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, my word. What do you think? You think it can work? Uh, well, what I think is so... Yes, and I say yes because you have a track record of this and because... Well, I think about how much of my work was... Somehow I, j I, I just go back to my own story of someone going, well, that's not possible, and me thinking, no, people needed ex need people would do this people mm -hmm. if you could talk to people like this they would respond and then it turns out that yeah. what everybody was saying wasn't possible was possible and i look at you and what you've done and at every stage there's somebody going no nah, it's not going to work and then it did and i look at this and i think yeah 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 because this was the this was the this year was well, that pa the past campaign we just had was the year for a third-party candidate, if there ever was one, with two candidates yeah. running with the highest yeah. um, lack of approval ratings in modern history. So then I, I was always thinking, somebody, this is ripe for somebody to come along from outside, really, truly outside the system. But then you're taking it much farther and going, no, just rethink the whole system. Yeah, And yeah. that is just, I think... I don't know. I bet a lot of people listening to this are like, that's a great idea. I hope so. Now, and, and also, okay, and this so is where some brand of your... Brandnewcongress.org. Yeah. Go there, sign up, uh, and, do and nominate somebody. And the, and the other thing is that, that part of what this is about is about running a, uh, about making an alliance between, of, of the good people from the two subcultures that I spend most of my time in. Oh, interesting. So I work in the progressive, secular slash atheist, you know, progressive world. And, you know, and I, but then I live in, I actually live in, so we moved to my wife's hometown. So I live in the, in the Ozarks in Southwest Missouri. I go to church there. You know, everybody in my, in my life at home is conservative and Christian. And, um, and so I'm, I'm deeply, you know, rooted in both of these two subcultures, right? It's sort of the two, the two biggest demographic tribes of America, white, white secular progressives and white and Christian everybody, conservatives. And everybody, the big story, everybody keeps saying we're so divided, we're so yeah. divided. And you're saying, let's not be divided, and here's a way. Yeah, and you know who really hates that idea is a whole lot of my progressive brothers and sisters, because they, like I used to believe, they think that all of the Christian conservatives are just kind of evil, you know? And, and here's the thing. I'll, I'll tell you, because I've lived in both of these subcultures for a long time now, and both those two subcultures have equal portions of evil people, just kind of bad people, blah, don't really care people, good people, and saints. Just totally amazing, Humanity awesome, Humanity tends to be people. fairly consistent. Yeah. And, and so, and so the, and, the, and, and when you get them in the room to get, when you take the good people and the amazing, beautiful, wonderful people from both of these cultures and you put them in a room together, unfortunately, they don't know what e each other's talking about and they start fighting. And usually the Christians are really polite, actually, and, you know, don't know what's happening. But, uh, but you know, they, they, they think that, that they're totally opposed. And, and so, so part of what we're going to actually try to do was as part with Brand New Congress is... We're in these deep red conservative districts. We're going to be going and getting the conservative Christians who listen to the Robcast, for example. I'm really counting on you guys out there because I know you're out there. And <laughs> really? need, yes, there are. Yes, they, they they are out there. I know because there's all kinds of people where I live, you know, who uh, you know went went to all these little really? Christian colleges and they're still listening. Yes, they really Fantastic. are. Fantastic. They really are. Hi, so, everybody. Whoever that is, hi. Yeah, <laughs> you guys send Rob an email and tell him that you're still there. And uh, and but but before you do that, go to brandnewcongress.org and nominate somebody because oh, so the I love but, it. so we're gonna get those people, we're, and um you know who actually want the best for America and they're not a, which is the majority of the people in these deep red conservative districts. And it's only the people who get all wrapped up in Republican politics, just like the people that get wrapped up in Democratic politics, who are, you know, like super just want to fight with each other over these, you know, divisive issues, right? And so the, the next thing people say is, oh, so you're going to compromise on all these issues and try to find some like middle of the road thing. And no, that's not what we're going to do. Um, because like the good people in both of these subcultures really want the best for everybody. They want they want the most life 
they want you know like for they're they're like the best people in both of these communities are both of these subcultures they're both they're all pro life pro life in the sense of opposing stupid wars where we've killed millions of people opposing police violence right that on that you know against unarmed people um opposing mass incarceration opposing that we have 80,000 black men in solitary confinement right now today which is torture right pro life in that sense right and also and we are going to have some conversations that that are going to be difficult like around abortion the conservative christians are really going to want to see way less abortions and the progressives are not going to negotiate on and I don't think they should on keeping abortion legal. And um, but there is not a compromise to be made, but a collaboration, where um, you know, like like this year um, actually has is like the lowest number of abortions I just heard on the news for for decades, right? So you know, let's have a conversation about so your how thing to actually is get everybody in a room, yes, together, and all sorts of new things. Yeah. can happen. Yeah. It won't happen as long as everybody stays entrenched in the same old categories, opposing each other, throwing rocks at each other from across the Great yeah. Divide. And we don't need compromises be- between the Republican and Democratic positions. We need a collaboration for a totally radical explosion to a whole new, beautiful future. Brandnewcongress.org. Yeah. Please come, and uh, <sighs> especially from those red districts, guys... If you have one of these... Uh, if you've, If you're just sick and tired of where the Republican Party has gone and sick and tired of where the Democratic Party has gone, please come and nominate somebody and, like, I will call you. Just sign up. I will give you a call. If you nominate Zach somebody, anything Exley like what we're looking will for. will call you. Yeah, if you nominate somebody who's anything like what we're looking for, you know, of those criteria, good at what they do, doing the work that's running America, lives for others... Ready to run. Not not ready to run. That's the other thing we didn't talk about is like... Well, oh, there's we, certain reluctance. This is not oh, somebody who's out striving. Yeah, 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 I got th- it. And that's, but that's, that's like the hard that. thing. Yeah, like, uh, so like I had 10 people that I knew and I'm trying I'm trying to recruit them and they're like, no, you're right, crazy. Right, exactly. Yeah. The person, your friend who's like, I'd be an awesome politician, that person on Facebook, I would be awesome if I was no, in power. we don't want them. <clears throat> yeah, gone. Right. The person who's like me, yeah. now we're getting closer. Yeah. You're talking about me? I just do this. Yeah, exactly. yeah. 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 So we're reluctance we're actually, is one of your criteria. Yeah. And 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 actually, like you know, by the time this airs, we will actually have candidates up there, and and some of these people are actually going to be yelling at us, like this friend of mine. He's like, no, 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 and like he was laughing for a long time. You know, he was laughing about you know how this whole idea and that I was going to nominate him and everything. But when he realized I was actually going to do it, he got this sound of terror. You know. His name is Kurt Redema. I'm going to call him right out. Well, he, and every, I need everybody to email Kurt Redema in Kansas City and tell me there's a certain holy terror to, to yeah. this sort of responsibility. Yeah, that you essentially want. You want somebody with like a yeah. Oh, I, I should. This is this matters. I need to, I need to hold this with a certain fear and trembling because these are people's lives and this is our collective life and it matters. Yeah. Well, and they don't want to go to D.C. because it's the cesspool. But but yeah. I but the but the thing here is, once we get a critical mass of candidates, we say, look, you're all going to go together, right? And so you're actually going to be. It's not going to be a cesspool when we win a giant supermajority and you take the place over. <laughs> so, <laughs> brand new Congress. Dot org. I yeah. this inter. I have seriously, this interview. I I don't even know <laughs> what to say. I don't even know what to say. And I'm betting that my 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 people's listening are like, w- I'm gonna have to like digest this for a while. I hope so because this is okay. gonna change everything. And if we don't figure out if something if this doesn't work, then something else better work, because yeah. we're gonna be in a really really bad place. Well, thank you. Really soon. So thank thank, well, thank you for thank all you, for you do. Me on. You're so inspiring. Thank you for coming to the back house. Thank you for sharing it with us here. And um, I love the sense that who knows what this will dig up. But let's, let's do it. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. Thank you so much. Grace and peace, my friends. And that concludes our inauguration special edition <laughs> Robcast. Peace. Grace and peace, actually. Grace and peace, my friends. <laughs>